Hi everyone, here is our lesson on air resistance. In this lesson, we are going to learn how to explain why all objects fall at the same rate and apply friction concepts to air resistance, skydiving, and learn about terminal velocity. To start, let's revisit free fall. An object is said to be in free fall when the only significant force acting on it is gravity, right? Projectiles are in free fall. Something that's thrown straight up is in free fall. All objects that are near the surface of the Earth experience the exact same acceleration. We know this, right? It's 9.8 meters per second per second down. But why? If you haven't watched this Veritasium video from my website, check it out because it's pretty interesting. In this video, Derek goes around and asks random people on the street this exact thing and tries to get them to explain it using physics terms. Let's try to explain this idea by examining the forces on a feather and a hammer. So between a feather and a hammer, which object has the most mass? Well, clearly the hammer does. So which object has the most inertia? Still the hammer, because mass is the measure of inertia. Inertia is defined as the resistance to acceleration. So the hammer has a much higher resistance to acceleration. When we compare the force of gravity acting on the hammer to the force of gravity acting on the feather, it should be pretty clear that the force of gravity acting on the hammer is larger. However, because that hammer has a much larger resistance to acceleration, a larger force will result in the exact same acceleration when dropped in a vacuum. In essence, the object with the greater mass is pulled down by gravity with a stronger force, but that object also has more inertia or more resistance to that force, and so they will accelerate at the same rate. Remember, Newton's second law tells us that the acceleration is equal to the ratio of force over mass. So, even though the hammer has a much larger force on it, it also has a much larger mass, and so that ratio stays the same. So compare a one kilogram object with a hundred kilogram object. The force of gravity on a one kilogram object is gonna be 9.8 newtons, while the force of gravity on a hundred kilogram object is gonna be 980 newtons. Both would result in a 9.8 meters per second per second acceleration. Let's say we had two masses. One is measured to be hundred grams, the other is measured to be a thousand grams. If I apply the same force on both of these masses, you should be able to tell me that the one with the larger mass will have a lower rate of acceleration. In fact, the rate of acceleration on the larger mass would be one-tenth that of on the smaller mass because the mass of the larger one is 10 times larger. But what if I applied a force on the larger mass that was 10 times larger than the force on the smaller mass? How would the accelerations compare? Well, since the ratio of net force to mass is the same for both, we would have the exact same rate of acceleration. So that's exactly what's going on if we were to take both of these masses and then drop them in a gravitational field near the surface of the Earth. Even though this one has 10 times the mass, it has 10 times the force of gravity on it, so our rate of acceleration would be exactly the same. So remember, Newton's law states that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. Go ahead and try to fill these out on your own, comparing a falling elephant to a falling mouse. So pause here. Once you're done, click play and check your answers with mine. Of these two animals, the elephant has the most mass, but both accelerate at the same rate. The elephant, because it has the higher mass, will experience the greater force, but it doesn't accelerate more than the mouse because it has more inertia. So when a bowling ball and a feather are dropped in a vacuum, they're both going to drop at the exact same rate. However, this is only true in a case where there's absolutely no air. In most cases, we're going to have to account for air resistance. You don't have to be moving at a very high speed to have experienced air resistance on your body. If you've ever stuck your hand out of a moving car, you've probably felt the resistance that the air has on your flesh. You stick your hand out of the Jeep, that wind pushes your hand backwards. Air resistance is a function of cross-sectional surface area and velocity. That's why different things can be more or less aerodynamic, meaning, depending on how something is shaped, it will experience less air drag. So as objects move through the air, they experience a contact force as a result of the object colliding with air molecules. 
The amount of air resistance is dependent on two things, the speed of the object and its cross-sectional area. So let's say we have a bunch of these cars driving at a constant speed down the highway. As we talked about earlier, in order to maintain a constant speed, the net force on an object has to be zero. All of these vehicles are experiencing a resistive force, but some are experiencing more than others. The semi right here is experiencing a much larger force of air resistance because of its shape. And so it's required to apply a larger forward force just to maintain a constant velocity. That's one of the main reasons why a car like this has lower gas mileage than a car like this. All right, let's do a quick conceptual check. If I have a ping pong ball and a steel ball at the same size, and I throw them both at the same speed, 30 meters per second, which one ex would experience more air resistance? Now you might want to say that the ping pong ball experiences more air resistance because the steel ball will pretty much keep this speed once it's released, while the ping pong ball slows down immediately. However, because they have the exact same shape and size, and they're moving at the same speed, they both experience the exact same force from air resistance. The reason that the ping pong ball slows down so quickly is because its inertia is much lower than that of the steel ball. So the resulting acceleration from the same force is a lot larger. Let's take this idea and apply it to an elephant and a feather falling through the air. Which one would experience the most force from air resistance? Now again, you might be tricked into thinking that the feather has more of a resistive force on it because it slows down immediately while the elephant would speed up continuously. However, because that elephant is larger, right, has a larger size, it actually is colliding with more air molecules per second and so experiences a larger force from air drag. So using your own words, and try this on your own, explain why, if a feather and an elephant were to be dropped from a tall building, the elephant would hit the ground first. It comes down to the size of the gravitational force on each of these objects. The force of gravity on a feather is really, really small, close to zero. So just a small amount of air resistance would cancel out that force, causing the feather to be in equilibrium and maintain a constant speed. But the force on the elephant is really large, so it accelerates for a long time before the air resistance becomes a significant factor. Now let's look at the consequences of the second variable that affects the amount of air resistance, the speed of the object that's going through the air. When a skydiver first jumps out of a plane, their vertical velocity is zero. So the only vertical force acting on that skydiver is the weight. There's no air resistance yet because they're not moving down yet. So their weight is their net force, so they're in free fall and accelerating at a rate of 9.8 meters per second per second. But as they begin to speed up, the amount of resistive force acting on them starts to increase. And so their net force starts to decrease. And remember, net force is directly proportional to an object's acceleration. And so, the rate of acceleration starts to go down the faster these skydivers are moving. That rate of acceleration, or the net force, is going to go down, down, down until the weight and the air resistant force are equal and opposite. Once that happens, acceleration stops because the net force is zero. This is called a state of terminal velocity meaning that no matter how much longer this skydiver falls, they will continue moving at this exact same speed. In the simplest terms, terminal velocity is the maximum speed of a falling object. And an object hits terminal velocity because the force of air resistance balances out the force of gravity. So that the net force is zero and the object is moving at a constant velocity. Let's next calculate the net force and acceleration of a skydiver from the time he jumps out of an helicopter to the time he hits terminal velocity. So in the beginning, the only force acting on him is gravity. So the net force is equal to the gravitational force. We can find the acceleration on this skydiver by taking the net force divided by his mass, 833 divided by 85, which comes out to 9.8 meters per second per second. Makes sense. It's in free fall. As that skydiver starts to speed up, it gains a significant amount of air resistance. 
So our new net force is going to be 833 minus 350. And our new acceleration is going to be our net force divided by 85. In diagram C, the air resistance is larger, but still smaller than the force of gravity. So our net force is 833 minus 700. Take that net force divided by 85, we have our acceleration. And then finally, the air resistance will match the gravitational force. When those are equal, the net force will be zero, and so our acceleration will be zero. All right, pause here, fill in the blanks to check yourself for understanding. Once you've filled in all the blanks, press play and check your answers with mine. As an object moves faster and faster, the amount of air resistance increases until the state of terminal velocity is reached. Once terminal velocity is reached, the force of air resistance is equal to the force of gravity. Hence, the object will stop its acceleration and continue with a constant velocity. That's it for this lesson on air resistance. Make sure to write down any questions you have, bring them to class next time we meet, and I'll see you guys soon.